Hey, I'm Tyson James, president of Sound Faith Consulting, here with you today with a special interview. I've got with me today uh, screenwriter and marketing expert, Lori Twitchell. And uh, the reason I wanted to bring her on is because um, she saw that what we were doing and just thought it was interesting. So she connected with me and just wanted to chat. And so we had a phone call and it was just the most amazing phone call. I just learned so much about her and what she's been involved in in the past few decades. And she's had an amazing life. And so I just was like, hey, Lori, can you come on and just share yourself with our viewers? Because I want more people to know about you and uh, the, the work that you've done and uh, how that possibly might segue into things that, what, uh, that we're doing uh, with our company. So, Lori, thank you so much for joining us. Absolutely. I don't know. You you think I'm really cool and amazing. I don't from sitting from my end. I just I'm just me. <laughs> uh, you're a rock star. <laughs> so um, like I said, what, what I'm going to do first is just kind of ask you some biographical questions and then we'll get into some of the business side of things. But um, first question. What is your earliest memory? What is my earliest memory? I didn't tell you I was going to ask you this. So no, this is you off, didn't. Off your head. <laughs> <laughs> this is definitely not a typical interview setup at all. Um, probably playing outside when I was little. Um, I lived at a place where we didn't have neighbors and we had lots of, you know, woods around our house and things. And I, I was constantly outside, you know, playing. And so I pretty much think playing in the sandbox outside in my yard is one of my earliest memories. Oh, very nice. How about how old were you? Did did you say? Oh, I had to have probably been three, maybe. Yeah, three or four. Really, really, really young. Yeah, because we moved into town when I was six, and so, yeah. Wow. All right. Very cool. That sounds like a good memory. That works. <laughs> <laughs> good deal. So you're a screenwriter. You're a marketer it sounds like the screenwriting came first like what got you um sort of were you writing at a young age like were you always sort of attracted to that um and and what was it that drove you kind of in that direction I, I, absolutely my whole life i've been about writing and reading um, i was an only child and both of my parents worked. So I spent a lot of time at the library and in books, books were my friends. And um, you, know, you asked about my earliest memory. One of my earliest memories involving writing was that my parents had this, um, my mom had this big old, huge typewriter, one of the heavy ones that weighs like 20 pounds. Oh yeah. And, um, but it had a suitcase. So I used to tug it and I took it outside and took one of my favorite books and put the paper in and I did line by line what was oh, you were. the little golden book. And <laughs> then when my mom came home, I was like, look, I wrote a book. <laughs> and so, yeah. And um, one of my favorite books when I was a kid growing up was this big, huge, massive, a friend of mine had it. Um, whenever my parents went to his house, I would always pull it out, this massive, book about disney and animation and storytelling it was it's golden and it's a big coffee table book that huge thick thing and every time that you turn the page it had a different behind the scenes story it had pictures of like julie andrews voicing mary poppins and the whole animation on the other side of you know going and so storytelling has always been fascinating to me wow really cool so an only child um how was that growing up then was your just imagination kind of keeping you company and you know absolutely yeah, yeah my imagination was you know my i i joke with people i've shared the memes like yeah there's lots of voices in my head but they have really good ideas um i was the person who imagination play was always the thing um you know my barbie doll i, I would cross universes my barbie dolls was in love with Han Solo and had R2-D2 as a butler and, um, you know, just anything and everything was wide open and, and books were the thing. I actually always believed that when I grew up, I would write books. And that was what I went to college uh, for was I have two degrees, one in creative writing and one in technical writing. 
Mm. And I grew up in a town where there is history on every single corner. Um, my, I had friends who lived in houses that have the historical plaques on them. Um, it was the place where the world's first oil well was ever drilled. And so, and John Heisman learned how to play football there. And yeah, a lot of things like the Carnegie's and the Rockefeller's made their money in my hometown. And so majoring in creative writing, minoring in history, I thought for sure that I was going to end up writing historical novels. I also was a about an hour and a half or two hours outside Mr. Rogers' actual neighborhood. And wow. I believe that storytelling was a big part of, of things. So yeah. I've always been about story and telling people I just never expected it to be in film or television. That's really cool. Mr. Rogers, personal hero of mine. So uh, I would love to go you know, visit his hometown sometime. Um, Backing up from college a little bit, did the attraction to writing um, sort of express itself in high school as well? Were you involved in like any clubs or, you know, did it show in your, you know, classes or, you know, activities? I mean, like Lori Twitchell being voted the most likely to write a book and write a best oh, yeah. and... <laughs> being editor of the newspaper in the yearbook, um, working at the local newspaper. It was a small town. So my mom worked at the newspaper and it, in high school, I was even covering stories and writing features, you know, not hard news, not hard or fast news, but writing features for the newspaper and things. So yeah, very much writing has always been a major key part of my life. That's Man, it, it sounds like there was, you know, sort of this path that you were on from, you know, the minute you were born almost. I took forever. Mm -hmm. Like, I was good at a lot of things and, you know, interested in a lot of subjects. So I got to college and I was like, what in the world am I going to do? I just, you know, decided to double major because I was like, well, I, I don't know what I'm interested in or what career I want to go into. I'm just going to, you know, take as many classes as I can in different areas and hope that one wins out over the other. So, Sounds like for you, it was more of a, you know, this is what I'm doing and I'm just going to pursue that. Yeah. And I did, you know, um, all my teachers in high school, all of all of my teachers all the way through everything. Um, I had one teacher in second grade who said Lori talks all the time. I think part of that was because I um, I was home alone often and I was on my own a lot. So at school was where I could socialize. But I find it funny because my son, uh, when he was in, in elementary school, um, his teacher said he talks a lot, but it, I have a hard time putting him in trouble for it because he's like helping the other kids with their lessons and he's teaching them. And she said, I realized one day he was helping the kids get through their lessons so that they could have more playtime um, <laughs> kind of thing. So um, it, that's always been sort of there in the, in the storytelling and things, but I did have a lot of, um, I have one college professor in particular, um, I went to a couple of colleges before I landed on the one that I finally, um, graduated from. And that was because the different colleges that I went to had different levels of writing. Um, the first one that I attended, I was doing i was looking at journalism because that was the best writing that they they had and that really wasn't a fit for me um but one of the professors there said it's really stupid for you to want to major in creative writing and she said you're never going to get anywhere nobody's going to do anything she said your very best bet is to teach and then get a master's or a phd later in creative writing but starting creatively isn't so going to get you anywhere going into it. Yeah. And wow. so um, that did shape some things because she was, she was a very hard professor. She was one of the ones that wasn't known to be like the, she's not the mentor you wanted. Like she's the kind of hard, not great person, but the college that I ultimately ended up at um, had a major in creative writing. And then it was the first place in the country to have a technical writing major. And the, the woman who created the technical writing major in the United States was one of my professors. 
Wow. So I thought, wow, this is the best of both worlds. I can learn the tech writing side and technical writing can be anything from, I, I had a whole class on learning how to write ingredients on the back of cereal boxes and how to write the marketing copy on the back of, you know, because every people don't stop to think how much writing is actually still out there. But I learned how to write step-by-step -step instructions for like a cake mix or whatever. And I learned a lot about computers and most technical writers, they go into a field. It could be medical writing where you're working on translating medical reports for the patients or whatever um, it might be, or for an insurance company. Uh, computer mm -hmm. writing, I remember at one point in my career, I thought, well, all the fun stuff is over. I'll just sit at night and edit computer manuals um, because that's gonna pay. Uh, so that was why I ultimately ended up at that college was I, I felt like I had, like that was a wise decision to learn how to write all those things. And it really was, it blended everything together for me. Now I can write marketing copy, website copy. I tell people that I'm an expert in verbal judo. I, I watch television, pro I watch reality television programs and go, oh man, you, wish, you probably shouldn't have said it that way. If you would have said it just this way a little bit, it would have changed everything. Um, yeah. and then creatively, uh, my brain has always been a creative fire. So I have ideas that don't stop. And that's why I ultimately started my marketing company because I said, I have all the ideas they are outside the box. Someone may as well pay me for them. Yeah. And what's the name of the company? Beyond the Buzz Marketing. Beyond the buzz marketing. Yeah. Because I couldn't settle on just one thing <laughs> beyond <laughs> the buzz. Um, it would have been great to do just PR, but you know, that's one of those things in the world where I've I've done, I think we talked about this in our call, like Lucy and Ethel on the chocolate doing chocolate and they just move it mm -hmm. on to the next person. I've done each of the jobs um in a film production or in television production, even in publishing. Um, where I'm able to kind of craft things and move them in a certain direction. So, yeah, we're, we're going to name drop some of the stuff that you've done uh, in a minute. But first, let me ask. Um, so you went to college, you've got these writing degrees, but was there a gap between graduating and getting into the industry or getting a break in the industry? Or did you just go directly from graduation to into a writing profession? I think I had, um, I had a regular sort of gap like anybody else. I took a summer off mm -hmm. um, and I started working at a radio station, a local radio station as their continuity director writing commercials. And I, you know, I answered the phones and I greeted people at the front door and then I wrote commercials. And through that, I learned a lot about, you know, if I write this commercial for Tim, he's, he can do, you know, those like the drug ads at the end where it talks, you've got that person that talks really fast and you know, it's being sped up by a computer. Tim could do that without the computer. And so oh, I could, wow. I could put a 45 second commercial into 30 seconds, as long as it was going to Tim. So he was um, like, side effects may include blah, 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 blah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, but on the other end I had, a guy named Tom who was creative and his were, were always a little bit slower and, and things like that. And then our news guy, Paul, if you wanted, you know, someone you could trust on the, on the thing. But in the course of that job, I answered the phone one day when the boss called and he said, you have a really great voice. I'm putting you on the radio. And I had never expected that. <laughs> and I said, Oh, okay <laughs> and a week later i was doing uh, lunch drive time from 10 to 2 and i would go in first thing in the morning and i would record all of my segments my voice tracks and then i would just do the rest of my work for the rest of the day and um that was a really fun job it taught me a lot i reconnected with the man who hired me a few years ago on Facebook. And I said, I really need to thank you for putting me on that path because he didn't, he was not a boss that said no to my ideas. Mm -hmm. And 
I ultimately, before I left that job, I ended up being one of the main radio announcers and I was also a promotions director. And so I got to work with some international companies and my little promotions in Northwestern Pennsylvania ended up increasing sales at companies. <laughs> Several times in the point of my career, I've had companies call and say, who are you? <laughs> why, why are we selling things this much in your area? And it was just because of something that I was doing. And that happened with um, the Jim Henson company at one point and TV guide at another point. But then that was the Please first time out here. Please tell people what the Jim Henson company is and, and what they are involved in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Just in case nobody knows what the Jim Henson company is. Um, I worked on a, fan campaign for a, a science fiction television show that not not a lot of people have heard of it's it's still it's gaining popularity but farscape it was only on the air for a few years and it got um it got canceled by the sci-fi sci channel left on a cliffhanger and you know did they live did they die whatever and they canceled it and so at that time i was living on a military base in new jersey and uh, it was right after 9 11 and i lived an hour outside new york city and two hours from shanksville i was in i was in what they call the middle of the triangle and uh, three hours from the pentagon and so i was right in the center of everything and i i watched these people deploying literally from my front yard and I told the fans of the show, if, if you guys want to do something for the troops, go ahead and send me DVDs. Uh, you know, we didn't have streaming at that time. And so I would say, I'm not buying DVDs for everybody, but if somebody wants to buy them and have them shipped to my house, um, you know, in the times before the internet was a little scary and you'd, you know, whatever. So I, I, put out my, I mean, I lived on a military base that had lots of people with guns protecting it. So it wasn't so scary, but we ended up sending over $50,000 worth of DVDs overseas. And we became the first fan campaign in history to become official sponsors of the U S Navy. So we had Farscape wow. in every port everywhere that you went and it became known as the Farscape military campaign. And that was where you have, you know, representatives from Jim Henson company calling your house and going, who are you? Why are there $50,000 worth of DVDs coming to your house? What are you doing? Kind of thing. And so that's where that all went. And the show did end up coming back. The Farscape, the Save Farscape campaign did a lot of really good things. We donated things to women's shelters. We sent gifts to critics so that they would write about the show. And um, it did end up coming back and they wrapped it up in a mini series. So uh, that was, that was kind of fun. So now that we've brought up Farscape, uh, <laughs> let, let's go ahead and talk about how basically your career sort of like uh, just exploded from, you know, very humble beginnings there. Yeah. Very humble beginnings. I had um, at the time I was doing all this, I, I had, my kids were toddlers or infants. My youngest son, who is now 19, um, we had a Farscape baby shower for him, at, you know, my military housing, the, the fans of Farscape threw a baby shower or whatever and sent gifts. Um, and then my husband got orders to come to San Antonio, which is where I still live now. And again, I thought that was really cool. Um, that was a fun part of my career, but probably get a job doing the computer. That was actually the thing. I'll probably be editing computer manuals at night after the kids go to sleep. And we moved down here to San Antonio and I didn't, I wasn't aware that the fans of the television show had written to a man down here who was making a movie that had the lead of Farscape in it, Ben Browder. And they said, if you want somebody who understands Ben Browder's fans, um, call Lori. And so one day, because you had been writing what? Well, I had been doing all of these. I, I had been writing fanfic for the show, which wasn't 
anywhere part of my career plan <laughs> anywhere but um because i had conducted all those campaigns and i understood the fans of the show and so they and ben was in this film that wasn't a science fiction film it was it was a murder mystery thriller um but they said if you want somebody who understands his fans work with her so i randomly got a phone call from this guy in dallas and i had just moved here i had three kids under the age of six um and he said i'm bringing an actor from the movie into the alamo draft house why don't you show me what you've got and I didn't know anybody down here. I literally, when you have three kids under the age of six, I joke that you're in the trenches. That's when you <laughs> don't get out. You don't socialize. You know, you're lucky to get, uh, you know, out the door with shoes on. You're like, um, do I still remember how to talk to adults? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You've got, you know, Sesame Street and Blues Clues playing in the background all the time. And it makes you think, am I, am I actually a functioning adult? You know, those toddler years are tough. But, um, you know, challenge accepted, I guess. He said, show me what you've got. So I just started calling because I had the radio station background. I started calling radio stations until I found someone who was a promotions director. And she had a crush on the actor we were bringing in, which was C. Thomas Howell from The Outsiders. And she, she loved him and the Brat Pack. And she was, you know, very excited. And I said, all right, if, if you can put together a promotion for us, I'll make sure that you get to go out to dinner when we are all there and we take Tommy out, you know, with all of us. And she said, okay. And a couple of days later, she, she faxed over a proposal and it was something like $25,000 worth of free promotion because she had found an, a woman who owns a bar who had a crush on C. Thomas Howell. And that woman was like, I could have him at my bar, really? So we ended up, um, it didn't cost my, my, he's now my producing partner. It didn't cost him a thing. And we ended up with $25,000 worth of promotion. Everybody who went to the movie, all they paid for was a movie ticket. But we had special edition tickets printed up that everybody could take home with them that had, you know, graphics from the movie. We gave everybody a bag because I said I like to make it an experience. And mm -hmm. it didn't cost a single thing extra for the people who were buying the tickets. But it made an experience that changed their lives. They got to literally go to this bar and have drinks with Pony Boy, you know, while we had the outsiders playing in the background. And at one point, the the guy that night was very interesting for me because I found out that he had let go of a PR firm that he had worked with on something else from LA. Mm -hmm. I did not in any way, shape or form, consider myself a publicist or a marketing person. I was literally a military housewife with toddlers just a few months out from having my youngest, you know, so overweight, and not feeling really great. And I remember these, these women came up and these, this guy, and they were all dressed like stiletto heels and the really fancy suits and they came up and he had been talking about me and i i didn't know that and they walked up and said oh so you're the publicist and i like looked over their shoulder and he's behind them going yep yeah, you're the publicist <laughs> um and they i remember that night they the man said to them if you come back these are the two women that are going to be handling your account and they had legs like up to my neck and I joked that I felt like a period rolling through exclamation points, you know, because they're just like stunning people everywhere. But we were at the bar later and he came up to me and he had a drink in his hand and, and he said, that's it. You're going to be my publicity person from now on. And I kind of laughed and smiled because people in this business, they'll say stuff like that and then you never hear from them again. You know, it's on film sets everybody's really 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 close and then the actor says yeah let's make sure our kids get together and have a play date and then you might never hear from them again right not until you've got another script or a project that they want to be in on <laughs> at least mm -hmm. um, but his wife came up to me and said he never says that i hope you know that and i kind of okay i was very overwhelmed because it had turned out really well and i was excited 
Uh, but a few months later, he called me and he said, I have a script I want you to look at. And I said, why are you having me look at a script? Because I had never mentioned my writing to him at all. And he said, um, we just had a meeting with Lifetime and they greenlit one of our programs. And I said, okay. And he said, when the fans wrote to me to tell me about how amazing you were, they also sent me your fanfic. And I was appalled. I had my, my writing professor from college in my head going, no, you don't ever want fan fiction. You don't want self-published books and you don't want any of this stuff because it's not, you know, and I had all that in my head. And I, I literally said, no, what? <laughs> no, -uh, what? And I was like, in my head, you're going through the catalog of what, what fanfics might they have sent? And one of them that they sent was Farscape written as a lifetime original movie. And it, it was totally kind of mocking the whole, like, you know, make somebody the abused person and somebody has cancer and somebody has this and that. All and of he, the lifetime tropes. Yeah, exactly. All the tropes <laughs> that you run into. But I took a science fiction show and placed it there. And it was an AU, an alternate universe fanfic. <clears throat> and he said, I had read it and the writing was good. He said, I was chuckling and laughing and got a kick out of it. And he said, but then we sat in the pitch meeting and you hit every one of the main story beats in that fanfic that they needed us to hit for certain things. And he said, they were talking about things and your fanfic was in my head. And so I didn't get writing credit on that, but he was kind of just giving me a chance and saying, yeah. what do you think? And several of my storyline ideas did end up in the final thing. That was Inspector Mom starring Danica McKellar. It was Danica McKellar's first role after being in the Wonder Years. Now, now everybody knows her from Hallmark and Great American Family and mm -hmm. everything that she's doing. Well, we were the first people to get, make her a mom. She was a soccer mom that solved mysteries. Um, we had two movies of the week and 10 hour long webisodes. And I did have a little bit of creative input on that. I did more marketing and PR on that than writing, but that was the start. And when he realized that he could trust, it, trust me on that end of things, it just went. And so the guy who came up to me at the bar and said, you're my PR person forever, um, is still my business partner. In fact, I've got a meeting with him this afternoon about a few things. He ended up being the producer and director of my film, A Horse Tale, that got picked up by Lionsgate. So it, the lesson learned here is, first of all, anybody can see your fanfic and it never goes away. So be careful. <laughs> what you say. If it's on the internet, it's forever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, it worked out well for me, but I know it doesn't work out well for everybody. So it's kind of a, a yeah, don't follow this as a career path, but make it a cautionary tale be wise in what you put on the internet but the other piece of that is that you never know what gig that you're working that might be the one that make, brings you to someone else's attention yeah. and so and will frame your career you could you could end up working the smallest gig but somebody looks at you and says yeah you know let's let's work together and you go from there so when they called you up for the lifetime stuff, what about what year was that? Well, Inspector Mom came out in 2006. So we were producing that in 2000, around 2004, 2005 time yeah. frame. We did, I believe we did all of those movies of the week and the um, 10 webisodes, which at the time, you know, n nobody was, this was the first thing that Lifetime had ever put as a series online. So we helped them with you know, breaking into the streaming world. Um, and so that would have been, I think we filmed it all that summer of 2006 or 2005, and then it came out in 2006. Yeah. So yeah, your, your kids had kind of grown up a little bit, you know, uh, so they, they were able to, uh, you know, take care of themselves a little bit. So to allow you to go do that. <laughs> Um, but before then, I just want to back up a little bit because this is an important part of your story. Um, you were, you had homeschooled your kids and in, I, I think on your website, it says 2014, was mm -hmm. it that 
um, you were diagnosed with cancer. I was, yes. So in 2014, that was a big year for me. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my movie, A Horse Tale, got greenlit. And so my very first film went into production. I'm the only writer on that one. So that was a big thing. And where you get to visit the set and you're not the PR person, you're the writer. Um, and people do look at you differently on that. So I literally was on set hanging out with the actors and thinking to myself, this is it. This is the big break. This is the <laughs> thing that's happening next. I'm finally here. Very excited. And went home from the set and was diagnosed with cancer in my mouth, in my tongue. And within eight weeks, I had half of my tongue removed and didn't speak or eat um, for almost a year. Like I spoke and I ate, but not fully, um, not big full sentences. It took about a year to get back to that. So yeah it was a very big learning year for me you go from i'm on the set i'm doing all these things it's going to be exciting and then uh, six weeks later you're in the icu for uh 10 days and can't speak no. and you you learn a lot when you can't talk when you have literally no voice the world does not have a lot of patience for someone who that you have to wait for them to type things out on their thing or you know or phone or write things out because it's a very fast moving fast paced existence that we're in yeah so i mean you can't tell now but like you're talking really you can't even nobody would know that just by hearing you talk but um you know you're only working with half a tongue right so i am it's really um, amazing how you've adapted with that yeah, my tongue um, is, I don't know how much, oh, let me get the camera out. My yeah. wrist is, yeah, um, my wrist is now the other half of my tongue. Um, my kids joke that, um, because there's a layer of shark cartilage in there. So we watched Sharknado as mom's family reunion. Sharknado <laughs> and Jaws, yeah. since I have some shark cartilage in there. <laughs> oh, my donor. We have very interesting senses of humor. We deal with things humor wise in my house a lot. Um, I always joke that no, life is notes for the sitcom. And so we very much have that. But uh, yeah, and the reality is that most people who have experienced this kind of cancer don't come out without some sort of speech impediment. It wasn't until um, I think a year to 18 months after everything and it had calmed down and my life was starting to get back to normal that my doctor said to me, most people don't speak after this because everything's around your voice box. So I've got, you know, I've got trach things, I've got scars, I've got all these things here. Um, I had, um, I believe 13 surgeries over a few weeks in one summer, oh. um, just surgery after surgery and, um, everything was focused right in here. So most people, their vocal cords are damaged. Um, I don't know if you've heard Julie Andrews, she talked about having some medical procedures and they, they damaged her vocal cords. Um, and then having chemo and radiation and everything focused right in here, most people don't speak. And when I talked to my doctor about that, when he said that, I was stunned. And I said, why wouldn't you tell me that? And he said, because I've learned that people live up or down to your expectations. If I had told the, someone that they might not ever speak again, they won't try with the speech therapist. And he said, not telling you that gave me the chance to see how you did. And I was homeschooling kids at the time. I And with my radio background, um, Right before that, I I still had an hour long radio program with Christian Work and Home Ministries where we interviewed people once a week. Uh, so my voice was a very big part of my career and to not be able to speak, but that would have freaked me out a lot. And so I just moved on and um, my speech therapist was an interesting person because I think she was just getting the bills paid. I ended up doing most of my stuff. She she rarely made any appointments and I ended up being the person who just pushed back. 
And so hearing that a year later, um, my first job back in the industry after having all that time off was um, working on the phone. I I got hired by um, a group called called Cash. Cash. <laughs> Yeah, I, I got I got hired by a group called Cash Day Entertainment to do group ticket sales on a on a film called War Room, and I ended up working with Sony Pictures. And my job for 10 to 12 hours a day was being on the phone talking to people. And none of those people realized that six months earlier, I wasn't able to speak a word. Here I am calling people every day on the phone, talking to them about why you should buy tickets to go see War Room. Goodness. And I, I think on the phone, on our phone call, you also said like, you try and do these types of interviews or speaking things earlier in the day, right? Because it's still, um, your, your speaking gets a little tired, right? Um, more I can. So, yeah. yeah. I, when I was working on the phone or when I'm working on the phone and I get to the end of the day, it can sound like I have been drinking <laughs> my, no. my words slur a little bit and I have to speak more slowly. Yeah. Um, it's not an impediment. It's just more of a, I'm tired yeah. and people still don't think twice about it. I just have to take a little bit more time with it. And yeah. And sometimes my voice just wears out and I'll lose my voice. And I do have incidents. Um, the radiation left my, my mat, all of the surfaces on the inside of my mouth are now extremely sensitive. And so I can't eat anything spicy. Um, I can't, and I live in San Antonio. It's like barbecue and Mexican food. Yeah. And so, <laughs> yeah, exactly. I have to be really careful with that. I had one, one time when I got some guacamole from the store and it was mislabeled. I had bought it and it said mild and it wasn't, it was hot. And I couldn't speak or eat for a week after one bite. I was on the floor, um, unable to move. Ketchup actually can burn my mouth. So I, I eat it because who eats a burger without ketchup? <laughs> Come on. Um, I, uh, there are a lot of things I power through, yeah. but I do have to be very careful. My, my kids refer to that as one of my super talents is taste. Um, I can oh. tell you if, if you order, um, if you order something from a cast iron skillet at a restaurant, I probably won't be able to eat it. I learned that the hard way because I I've learned what I can and can't eat. And I went to one place and they, I ordered, um, macaroni and cheese mm -hmm. that kind of came in a cast iron skillet. Well, somebody at some point had put jalapenos in there. It wasn't in the recipe, but the jalapenos were the in the seasoning of the cast iron skillet. Oh. Oh. Um, cross contamination is a thing for me. If I order pizza, I've got to be very careful. You know, if it's a restaurant that regularly has spicy or zesty in their in their stuff, um, I probably won't eat there because of the possibility of contamination. Even if I choose something like a grilled cheese sandwich or something that shouldn't have any of that in it. So now you have a super power. <laughs> yeah, if it's the same grill, I'm in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of people ask me, what can you eat? Um, you know, it's, or what can't you eat? That's the big thing today. People, you know, with gluten and, and people with food sensitivities, they ask, what can't you eat? It's just easier to say, um, usually Italian food is safe for me because who puts, you know, spicy in Italian food? Um, <laughs> You know, there, there are different things. So it's just, it's navigating. There's also choking hazards. My doctor told me never to eat salads because mm. my tongue can't control the different textures. So it becomes mm. a choking hazard. Uh, things, things like that. I'm every dietitian's worst nightmare <laughs> because I, um, I need to eat things with extra gravy or extra sauce because I've got dry mouth after everything. It's just, it's a thing. Well, so we are blessed to, you know, have you still speaking because um, you've got a lot of uh, just amazing experiences and a wealth of knowledge about these different
different areas that it would be a travesty if you weren't able to share them uh, with people like this. I mean, you could write about them, obviously, but, uh, you know, in this day and age, uh, who reads anything? Uh <laughs> yeah, I think we talked about that in the beginning. My writing has always been a, a way for me to be kind of, I've got the voice, but I'm voiceless, you know? And I have a friend who is, I have a couple of friends now who are pushing me out of the, yeah, you're going to, you need to be out there on video telling your story. You need to talk to people. So I'm getting there. I'm getting yeah. better at not hiding behind all the things. All right. So next question. Um, on our phone call, we talked about the difference between publicity and marketing. And not a lot of people understand that there is a difference. So can you just tell our viewers what the difference is there and why it's important? Yeah. Um, so publicity is casting out a net and basically you hope it gets picked up. You, you send out the press releases, you get buzz across a general audience. Um, you're just hoping to get picked up by the media and have them cover a story so that it hits their readers, their audiences. Marketing is more along the lines of saying, okay, who is in this film? What television programs have they been in? What other movies have, have they been in? And then going and finding their fans. Because no matter who it is, even if you've got the smallest role somewhere, there are fans of that television program that will go, oh, I remember that guy. I, I know who that is. And those are people that you specifically set up marketing towards them, which marketing has... Yeah, you know, social media is in a little bit of everything because Variety or Deadline or whomever might pick up the story and, and people find it on social media. Um, marketing is really having the audience. It, it's two different avenues. Mm. Publicity hits media and trickles down. Marketing goes to the audience and the fans and comes up and lets the fans and the marketing you know, lift that on the other end. And then hopefully they meet in the middle and sales is somewhere in the middle of all of that. People use publicity, marketing, and sales interchangeably. And they aren't, I can do marketing. I can do PR. I can do sales, but I don't like to sell anything to people. I just want to explain to you why, um, why people, why you might enjoy this movie. And I think filmmakers and authors they often they'll tell their story and they'll make the movie and they don't think about marketing because they assume if they're going to get picked up distribution wise it'll just take care of itself if my in the olden days if my dvd is on the shelves at walmart i'm 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 golden i don't need to do any marketing a lot of filmmakers and authors don't necessarily realize how much marketing they need to do they'll <clears throat> they write the, the movie or they direct the movie or the book and then they don't stop to think how do I have to sell this to people because in their mind their job in that Lucy and Ethel assembly line that I mentioned earlier their job is done they figure that they're going to move it on to the next thing in the you know 20 years ago yeah, you would have moved it on to the next thing. Even, you know, 25 years ago, you would have moved it on to the next thing. Nowadays, you can't. You you have to understand marketing. Um, every day, I come across filmmakers who have gotten distribution deals and the distributors promise, we're going to do this, 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 and this with marketing or PR. And because they don't know the language and the speak, and they don't understand exactly what people are saying, they sit back and they let that other person take their passion project or their life's project and do something with it. What they don't realize, and this happens with publishing and with film a lot, is that those agencies and a lot of those, those distribution and marketing partners they have a cookie cutter recipe that they do and they'll say we're going to push this out to our hundred thousand fans on facebook and we're going to do a live and we're going to do this what they don't realize is that that person does the exact same thing for every other movie that has happened before that 
and for every other book that has come out i owned a, a review website for books and i reviewed hundreds of books i got on the list in fact i'm still getting books these days asking people to uh, you know people asking me to review them and i would get the exact same letter and all it is is the new description of the book popped in there and the and the graphics the cover art and it's the exact same press release new from this author blah 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 there's nothing different about it and so for me it, when i was at the height of that it was nothing to get 20 or 30 emails a day with those exact same pitches worded the exact same way it's a copy paste thing and they send that same copy paste to all the bloggers and the influencers and all the people that's part of the publicity hoping it gets picked up and it is technically going out to their hundred thousand fans it's going out to their extensive marketing list it's going out to their email list it is going and doing all those things they aren't lying but they aren't technically marketing the film for you they're literally just sending it to their pipeline and saying we acquired this if you're interested in it you can pick it up so if you are saying to yourself my movie is going to be on tubi or my movie is going to be on youtube tv or like right now one of my films is on stars um, and roku uh, if if it wasn't being marketed there are a hundred a thousand movies on stars right now i still have to tell people go find it here mm -hmm. uh, it's equivalent of having a really fantastic five-star restaurant but you're in the middle of the desert and nobody realizes it's there you can have the great quality and the entertainment or you have a five-star restaurant and it's on the las vegas strip and everybody is out there calling and doing something different and you walk down the street and you get hit a million times while you're walking down the street what sets your film apart what sets your book apart you have to find the audience and speak to them and it's surprising for me when i say to a filmmaker who is your person that is supposed to come see your film and why why would that couple pay to get a babysitter and buy tickets and probably go out to dinner because most people these days when they go out to a movie they, it's a date night so they're doing dinner and a babysitter that can be upwards of 150 bucks depending on where you live paying for the babysitter and the movie tickets and dinner what makes your movie important enough for them to make that appointment time what makes your book important enough for people that when they're at the end of their day after their kids are in bed when they're exhausted and they're tired and they just want to let go what makes your book the book that they'll reach for and most people who are creatives they haven't thought that far ahead because in their world i told the story that i was supposed to tell somebody else should be doing the pickup on that well nobody else is going to market your film or your book the way that you will everybody else is just going to put it through a cookie cutter system and that's where i stand apart a little bit in the work that i do um, i like to tell people i shake up the snow globe a little bit because i ask those questions and i say how can we be different how can we get into somebody's news feed different i do the standard things you know the interviews and the press releases and i do all the standard stuff but what what sets it aside and so if i've got an indie filmmaker who's done a movie um we had one that i worked on that suicide was a a, a big theme in the movie so when it went to theaters in different areas we we connected with counselors and therapists and suicide prevention agencies and we did screenings for them that would help benefit them to get the word out then it's not just entertainment and the people are still just paying that ticket price but it's movies that are putting something into the community we had a military movie and um, we're able to gift by getting a sponsor on board they that sponsor bought tickets and we were able to put, fill the seats with wounded warriors and their families mm. and it was a heartwarming movie that that gave them you know good good vibes and good feelings i people ask what genre i like to work in i like to work in hope and joy i like it 
you know, people make fun of Hallmark movies, but there's something to be said for sitting down and having a moment where you aren't having to think about the next world war that's breaking out or the economy collapsing, or it's literally just going to be that really cute guy and that really cute girl. And they're going to meet adorable and they're going to get together. And at the end of the movie, you go, that was cute. Yeah. And I think even, uh, you know, from a, you know, manly man guy perspective, if you're not into lifetime movies, I think some of the best epic war movies and, you know, uh, just Ridley Scott films or whatever, um, the best ones also have themes of hope that run through them. Yeah, because it, it's entertainment as a whole <clears throat> for a long time took a very dark turn. We yeah. took things that when we were growing up were a little bit more fun and a little cheesy and a little pop, you know, whatever. You got Lois and Clark and Superman and, and the Christopher Reeve. It's all kind of clean. And then you move it to the pretty ugly side of things and you get realistic and dark. And that's great. That's fine. Some people use that for therapy to go, hey, my life isn't nearly as bad as all that. And people do call for realism um, in things and that's great. But entertainment should also be some sort of escape, too, where, you know, there are films that I don't go see because I was a military spouse. Um, my my uh, life was at one point I ended up going and watching Saving Private Ryan when I was eight months pregnant. Mm. and my husband was in the military at the time that was not entertaining for me that was not something that i could sit through <laughs> um easily and not be somewhat traumatized when you've got all the hormones and things going um but it did serve its purpose and so if, even if you serve up a heavier film but you give people hope at the end of it with like a you know event-based marketing thing where they can sit down and meet the filmmakers and say why did you make this movie or how are we going to benefit the community um, yeah. how is coming to this film going to to spread good seeds of good things that's that's where i live and that's where i like to work yeah um and for us as christians i i think we have to incorporate those themes into what we do right we're mm -hmm. We're not in the business of removing hope from people, right? Yeah. We we are in the business of, you know, bringing in these gospel themes of, you know, there's always hope, there's always redemption, there's always mm -hmm. love, right? Exactly. Um, so I think that that is something that's important. And we talked about how, you know, just turning uh, specifically to Christianity in entertainment and um, film and things like that how recently there's been a greater in uh, effort to intentionally bring high quality aesthetics yes. to Christian content, uh, as well as marketing, as well as publicity and all these things, um, really fusing the message with the business and the artistic side of things. So maybe yeah. you can talk a little bit about how you see Christianity benefiting from the business and creative side of things that you've seen in your career? I think that that, that is something that for a long time, <clears throat> we've always been, at least in my lifetime, a step or two behind technology and quality when we're in the faith world. Um, I'm not sure if that comes from, we don't want to embrace science and technology or we, you know, the old, old fashioned way works, but even in radio, um, for a long time, our our quality would was not in the music industry up there until we started bringing in producers from mainstream, and then all of a sudden you've got people like Toby Mac, and I remember that that whole revolution of Jars of Clay and and Toby Mac. I was working on the radio at the time, third day, where wow, you're hearing these people on mainstream radio because the quality is up there. Film has taken a little bit longer to get there. I also think that some of that is we don't want to be of the world. We're mm -hmm. not supposed to be of the world, but we are in the world. And that also comes from a difficulty of, I don't want to be big Hollywood. I, I moderate a group on Facebook called Christian Nerds Unite, and I hear these things a lot. We've got, 
uh, 15 or 20,000 nerds in there that talk about their favorite. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, that's where we met, right? Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, so on that end of things, I don't know, my camera went out. Oh, uh, yeah. You lost it. There you go. <laughs> um, on that end of things, I see people and they're complaining about big Hollywood and Hollywood values all the time. And I hear that in the in the news, even here in Texas, they um, pulled apart the incentive program for film because they said, we don't want Hollywood values here. And that always makes me sad because the rest of the world is looking at Hollywood for shaping things. Mm -hmm. When we eschew that and we run away from that and we say, I want to do something on my own that's when you're not necessarily getting the quality of everybody else. And that's when they don't take the word and the faith as seriously. And I think that <clears throat> for my career, I've gotten a lot of flack from Christians because I've worked on films that are not family friendly. If you go on my IMDb, you're going to find things that are not Farscape is not family friendly. It's yep. definitely not, you know, one of those but it's the entertainment that I watch. And there are a couple of films on there that aren't entertainment. I joke, this is not a Lori Twitchell production, but I, I prayed about each of those projects and I got put on those parts. And I would say, God, are you really sure that you want me on this film about this like psycho assassin murderer that's like shooting people in every single scene that's definitely going to be a rated R movie? And then you're doing a promotion with those people and you're in you're in a car you're in an uber and you're driving from place to place and you discover the people who made that film all of them were children of missionaries and that's how they met overseas with their parents as missionaries and i had i remember very vividly i had one guy look at me and say i don't think i've ever met an adult who lived their faith this way it was always like i grew up in church as a kid and then i left it when i grew up and he and some of the deepest talks that I've had about faith have come from the, the you know, that movie about assassins and people killing each other. Um, the, the horror slasher fl flick that is a cross of the grudge and the breakfast club. Um, one of the young women on that film that's a crossover. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. It was, it was a big crossover. Um, one of the young women on that film between takes, my kids were on set at the time and my, my daughter, I found my daughter talking to her and talking about how mom hates the Twilight movies because of, you know, some spiritual things and explaining some issues. And as a publicist, I'm in my head going, oh, don't do that. No, that's <laughs> what I'm going to do. But later that young woman came to me and said, I'm in the next Twilight movie oh okay <laughs> but everything that you said is absolutely on point and she ended up leaving and going and she's worked in faith films and family friendly films since then wow. i'm not saying that's because of me or what my daughter said but you never know what just like you never know what gig is going to break you through a mm -hmm. random gig where i am on a film set that is just dead bodies everywhere or even on that one there were their costumes were very small <laughs> there were days that that my producing partner would call me and say don't bring the kids today um because we're throwing water on the girls in their school costumes <laughs> oh okay yeah we're not going to come to set today but that film there were seeds that were meant to be sown while mm -hmm. i was there and had I looked at it and said, on the outside, it looks like this, then I would have missed the opportunity to affect her life. And she went on to be in several movies that made impact in, in the world. If we, if we as Christians, this is one of my biggest things, it's very hard to love people if you're pointing a finger at them and judging them and yelling at them. And in that group that I'm in, Christian Nerds Unite, there are a lot of people who are like, I hate Hollywood. Hollywood can fall off the face of the earth. They can, oh, were they on strike? They say things and, and stuff. You miss that those are actual people. And when you get behind a keyboard, you lose the humanity of it. I don't because I've been on a film set with 
A list and B list actors. And I've seen, I've seen them asking the questions. You know, I've, I had one actor that came to town. He had the number one program on television at the time. And I was driving around in my little falling apart minivan with him in the car. And, you know, he asked me what church I went to and I showed him and the church is one of those ones that's on television. And we went and drove around campus and he said he had a lot of questions and he said, I can't ask these questions publicly because people report on what I'm wearing today. Mm. It's, it's hard to ask those questions. It's, you, it's hard to be seen with a, a pastor or going to a church or anything like that under a microscope all the time yeah that was our moment for me to just be honest and go this is how i still am here i've had a number of people over my career that have said they refuse to work with christians because what they see is the media and those keyboard warriors the people who are yelling and screaming and angry and things and they are surprised to find out later that I'm a Christian. And I have a lot of people, there might be people who are watching this right now who are like, that means that your faith is not there and you're not being the light. But they all across the board have said, there's something about you that is different. Um, that's not because I'm anything special. That's because God placed me there for that yeah. moment. And um, I actually going to offend so many people right now. I actually, you might have seen it at some point during the interview. I actually have a tattoo. That's a new <gasps> thing in my life. Yes. Um, it's a permanent charm bracelet. Um, this is a Rebecca picture um, from the book of, from when they were looking for Isaac's wife. Mm -hmm. And if you get very close, it's kintsugi, which is the art of Japanese taking things that are broken and, and they're stronger. Um, mm -hmm. The foundation of it is almond blossoms which is from Jeremiah 1, 5 through 12, which the Lord gave, if you read that, the Lord gave the words to Jeremiah. He said, I am going to give you the words that you are supposed to speak. And for me, that meant a lot to me. And his promise was, what do you see in front of you? I see the blossoming almond branches. And so um, my charm bracelet, it's got a variety of different charms. I have Mr. Rogers sweater on here, by the way. Um, and I've got Snoopy doling out hearts, like instead of money, the gift, uh -huh. I've got Snoopy doling out hearts. But at the in the V right in here, that's Yahweh. And that's, I couldn't do Snoopy and Mr. Rogers. I couldn't give those love to people and, unless that was being fed. Even the, the vase, I've got it pointed so that when I shake someone's hand, it reminds me I am pouring into them. And then wow. when I'm praising, I'm lifting it up and it's being filled again. And my, wow. my tattoo artist is, she's not a Christian, but um, when I tell her what I want or why I want it, she's very, very sweet about doing that. She said somebody asked her if uh, she would do a charm bracelet for them. And she said, nope. She said, this is a, the idea came from a very special lady and I just will, because each thing means something. And there is actually a verse in Isaiah that I, I found, I was so delighted. It, it said, some people will say that they know me by name and some people will write my name on their hands. And that was when I was like, okay, I can put Yahweh on here and be okay. So. <clears throat> wow. So I, much thought went into that. I, I just absolutely love that, uh, especially the picture, you know, pouring into people when you're shaking their hand and then when you're, you know, worshiping, you're being refilled. That is just such a beautiful, beautiful symbol of the spirit. Yeah. And I'm very careful on that. I don't have a lot of, I have, a couple of pop culture, obviously Mr. Rogers is pop culture and uh, Snoopy is pop culture, but those are also longstanding things that aren't going to be tainted. And they are about loving people. When I told someone that I was getting Snoopy, they said, you have to have Snoopy hugging people because that's you. You just, you're the walking love and the hug. And I couldn't be that without God feeding into me. And I have had a lot of people, I've had a couple of people that just, they look at the at the tattoo and they they walk away because you know you're not that biblically there's issues with that but to me that's my witness on my hand because people ask about it they they a lot of people think that with snoopy and 
Mr. Rogers that it's the stick on tattoos. And when they realize it's real, then they want to know about each of the things. The only current pop culture thing that I have on there is um, from Ted Lasso. I've oh. got the Believe um, poster on there. And that's the only reason I watched Ted Lasso is because I had probably about a dozen people say to me, you are Ted Lasso in real life. You know that, right? Like you're, you're not mean and you, you don't do that. I think we come out of really hard circumstances and difficult things. And you can either be someone who's going to perpetuate that. Um, you know, if you're in an abusive situation or you've had difficulty, you can either be the next bully that's going to, you know, hey, I had to go through this. You have to go through it too. Or yeah. you can get to the top and turn around and lift your hand up and say, let's do this together. Nobody has to deal with that again. And that's what I choose to be. I <clears throat> love my marketing because I get to be the biggest cheer cheerleader in the front row while you're putting on your program. And that's what I tell people. I'll be in the front cheering for you as you make things go. Fantastic. Um Going back just a, a little bit to, you know, uh, Christianity and uh, production, um, who is doing some of the best work right now in Christian film, Christian um, production, and what what are they doing that other people aren't? Well, we've got, a, there's been a renaissance and a breakthrough in film on the faith end of things where people are really stepping out and making things happen. The Irwin brothers, uh, their wonder project was just announced this week. They've um, John Jonathan Irwin is opening a new studio here in Austin called uh, wonder productions. He, you know, he's done Jesus revolution and all of those films. Yep. Um, Angel studios is really shaking up uh, not just the quality of entertainment, but the way that things are being distributed. Um, they they one of the the main guys at the top is a good friend of mine mm -hmm. we used to sit and have lunches and talk about how we could shake things up and um i i like to shake up that snow globe and so does he and you say why can't we do it this way and so that's why you're seeing a lot of the films break through the shift was a, a fantastic film that i have a lot of my friends were involved in it everything is leveling up as we go the storytelling is getting better. And one of the things that I believe people of faith need to be aware of is that the reason some of the production quality and the reason some of those things are getting better is because of the people um, like myself that have been in the mainstream industry and learned at Disney and learned while working at Marvel Studios and learned these things. Um, you know, some of the folks on the shift have worked on science fiction films and and the big things and they've been on the big productions and they've worked with some of the large and they learn from the best and now they're bringing that learning to faith films and, and beginning to make them better and better the stories are better very few of us walk around spouting scripture in the course of our day very few of us are walking sermons and there's nothing wrong with those movies they they affirm and edify those of us in our faith uh, but sometimes um like my son my 19 year old when we went and saw the shift he talked about it for days afterwards and he grew up on film sets we were just talking about that he he grew up as one of those people watching the dead bodies walking around he learned a lot about makeup and how everything on television is not real i was very happy with that he could but, be a professional critic by now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so usually when we go to a faith film, he's like, ah, it's another faith movie, blah, blah, blah. When we left there, he said what he liked about it was that it didn't make everything peachy and perfect and happy. And it wasn't all unicorns and rainbows because I think in the faith world, we get enough of that darkness from the other side. So people tend to go sanitize it a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And so he said... I saw a guy who got beaten up and was bleeding and nearly died and still kept his faith. He lost everything and still kept his faith. Mm -hmm. And he said that that impressed me. And then, I mean, the acting was stellar in that. So those are the things that I think that we want to get to in our career. We want to we want to look at things differently and maybe, you know, explore some things deeper. 
Um, I do know that Dallas gets a lot of flack for it in The Chosen, but I've always been the people person who reads the Bible stories between the lines and fills that in. And so I love that he's doing some of that, taking the things that we've learned Bible school and Sunday school, and it's always the same highlights of the story. I I like looking at it a different way. I wrote a um, I wrote a, a stage play for here in San Antonio that was a, a Christmas movie, but it was all the perspective of the innkeeper who said no and then stuck them out in the manger. And how oh, wow. is his life affected in that way? Because there are, it's not just stories. There are people behind it. Right, them. right. What, what would that journey have been like when, when the guy got his vision back and he is running and seeing all these things for the first time? What would his life have looked like when often we focus on Jesus gave his vision back and that was it? Mm-hmm. I think that's something that we we need to do. And I think also as believers, we need to say those people in Hollywood, imagine if your very favorite actor or movie star became a Christian, what they would change. Maybe start praying for them instead of saying they're sinner, they're horrible, they're terrible and decrying the judgment and calling down, you know, <laughs> all the things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah we've already seen you know, some pretty high-profile celebrities recently converting to Christianity, and one of the things that they encounter is, uh, you know, like heavy criticism from Christians, and you're like, yeah. "What in the world?" <laughs> yeah, because both of those <laughs> things are amazing. Perfect, you know, like yeah, um, Pat Mondi was one of those people, the the tattoo yeah. artist, right? She converted to Christianity and suddenly, you know, people, she's under a microscope, obviously, is a highly public figure. And so when she's not, you know, perfect Mary Sue, you know, like this, this ideal that people have about what Christians should be, suddenly they're, they're being judgmental. And it's like, yeah. she's been a Christian for four minutes. <laughs> like, yeah, like, and where's the love and support? And where is looking at her life journey and saying, look at the testimony that she has? Yeah. Look at the beautiful testimony that is on display. We've lost that somewhere along the way. I feel like social media has become the magnifying glass mm. that just it it burns everything underneath it and makes it so big. And yeah, it's easy to be judgmental. I have a friend who left, um, she just kind of walked away from faith publishing because she wrote a couple of books where her characters had they'd had premarital sex before they accepted Christ and uh, audiences were just nasty about that you talked about sex before marriage in this book yes did you miss the part where she said she regretted it did you miss the part where she said she wished she could go back and change that but the reality is that every single person on this planet whether you're Christian or not whether you grew up in the faith or not has some sort of sin or burden or crack or something. That's why I made the the vase Kintsugi yeah. because I'm, I am absolutely not perfect. In fact, before this interview, I was texting friends going, I don't know why I thought that I should do anything because I'm, I'm not perfect. And people from my past, I have one guy I was working with who was an author who wrote a beautiful, beautiful book. And he didn't want to do any publicity because he was afraid the people who knew him when he would drink and when he was sleeping around before he got married would come out of the woodwork and that would ruin his testimony on the book. And I said, I, I think, I don't know when we became a people that all believed that we were sanctified and sanitized. And instead of saying, I really messed up, but here's the lesson that I learned in this part. Yeah, um, I think that's part of the humility that we need to be called for. It's not prideful. I can't stand when someone stands up and does an hour of their testimony talking about all the horrible worst things. And then I got saved and that's it. Yeah. <laughs> There's got to be a balance, though, because, yeah. you know, people who are watching this who knew me in high school and who knew me in college, they have those stories. But that was a different person than I am right now. And I'm not going to deny any of those things. Yeah. Um, I don't That's celebrate them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a it's a lifelong war, right? Um, everybody has 
a pass. That's why that's why we needed a savior to begin with. Uh, exactly. and, you know, scripturally, Hebrews 11, you've got the hall of faith, uh, you know, all these Old Testament saints that, you know, are described about as having great faith. Each of them had, you know, issues that, that we can read about in scripture themselves. Uh, David called, you know, the man of God, right? And how yeah. messed up was his life? Uh, his, I, I like to joke, you know, the, the final, basically his final words to his son, Solomon, were, here is a hit list. I need you to off all of these people when I'm yeah, gone. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And Abraham lied and told people Sarah was his sister. And, yeah. you know, there was a, I'm going to go back to my radio background and show my age. There was a group called For Him back in the day, and they had a song called I Want to Be Someone That You'd Write About, um, someone who had that faith. What you don't stop to think about the faith is that all of those people went through something absolutely horrible and terrible and awful to get to where they were. Yeah. I mean, yeah, David defeated Goliath, but how many years did he spend on the run in a cave running away from people who were trying to kill him and the Psalms? And I, I've told people when I had when I had cancer, one of the things that I would do at night was listen to the Bible being read by someone else. I would try to fall asleep because you can't get away from it. You, it's not like I need a break because my kids have been screaming all day. I'm going to go someplace quiet. You carry that that cancer is with you. It was in my tongue. It's not someplace that you know. It's it's in my body. So at night to try and get my brain to shut off, I would listen to the Bible. And you wake up. You think, I'm going to listen to the Psalms. Man, you wake up some of those Psalms. He's calling down some really nasty stuff on people, mm -hmm. um, on his enemies. Lord, show them this. Lord, show them that. Lord, show them this. And, you know, I think one of the things that's happening in modern, in modern evangelicalism and faith is that you've got the group of people who are saying, we've shown too much love and compassion. We forgive all the sins. We, we let this get away. So now we need to be super hard and super judgmental. And we need to be afraid of God. And then you've got the people on the other side who are just like, I'm going to let everybody get away with everything. And somewhere in the middle, we really need to, to have the understanding that these are people and people are not their sin. But we can't you can talk to someone in love i always said it was the it was a brick wrapped in a blanket the truth in love is that i have sat down with people and said i don't agree with your lifestyle but i love you mm. i love you and i'm not going to say no to you um i'm not going to excommunicate you from my life because that doesn't that takes the light away from their life i have had um my daughter work at a very prominent a coffee chain and this was very eye-opening for me i i can read people very well that's one of my things um i think that's what makes me a good writer i can get in into people's emotions and i can read a room i can see when someone's hurting or stressed or whatever i'll, I'll point out those people are having an argument over there how do you know that you, you can just see it and this young man was taking the garbage out and I was picking my daughter up and I said, he needs a hug. And she goes, you think? Yeah. Well, go give him a hug. What? <laughs> so, you know, it was almost a challenge and apparently I do that well. Challenge accepted. All right, fine. So I got out of the car and I said, do you mind if I give you a hug? And he gave me a hug right there in the parking lot. Except that when the when the time comes that you let go that general time he didn't let go and so i was holding on and holding on and holding on and i finally pulled back and he said i grew up in a home full of christians and when i came out my parents refused to speak to me that's the first mom hug that i have had in four years oh my goodness and at that point, I became the mom of that store. And there were a lot of young people working in the store at that time who had very similar backgrounds. And I became known as the mom of the store. I would walk in and they'd line up and give me hugs and, and things like that. But the thing is, what I saw in them was that they knew that any words that I gave them 
were coming from a place of love and compassion and care. And these same kids who were online and they were talking about, I hate conservatives and I hate Christians and I hate this and that. If I was going through the drive through I had one day, one woman, she had been all over the internet talking about how she hates Christians and blah, 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 blah. And I drove through and I made the order and there was like scurrying through the, in the background you could hear. And when I got to the window, it was her. And I reached up my hand and said, it's been a long time since I've seen you. And she started crying and said, I have had the worst day possible. And now Mama Lori is here to love on me. And I ended up pulling up the car and going into the place. And she said, I can't tell you what he's meant to me to have you. I can tell her, I can say, do you mind if I pray for you? To this young woman who was online talking about how much she hates Christianity and the Bible and Christians and everything. And I can say, do you mind if I pray for you? And I can pray fully and openly for that young woman because she knows it's coming from a place of love. And she knows that I don't agree with her lifestyle. But I, you want I will, that you know, through love that yeah. you've shown them to be able to speak that into their lives. Yeah. And I believe, you know, you need to be careful. Don't um, cut people off unless you absolutely know that it's the Lord telling you to cut people off because there yeah. are places where we need to do that. We can't be unendingly doormats for Jesus as one of my friends said, but if you take that burden upon yourself and you excommunicate that person from your life and you cut them out, you are taking the light away from them. You are taking away any ability to show that faith to someone. And that is, that is where I am. I don't argue theology. I don't, you and I talked about this. Like <laughs> yeah. if, I, if I do anything with you guys, it's not going to be, you know, Calvinism, Armenianism. Do I follow this theology? Do I follow that person? I don't. Um, I don't get into those kinds of arguments and things. I see people and I'm the same way with politics. I, <laughs> I don't, if you were to go back through my Facebook any election time, I would say I see people, not politics. Mm -hmm. I That's not the person that I am. I don't like labels. But I think we need to be really, really careful that we aren't so permissive that we say, yes, everything is, is all good. There's got to be some sort of, you can't have light without darkness. And, the and brick in the blanket back. Yeah. Right? <laughs> um, you got you to gotta bring in some some pain a little bit sometimes to exactly. actually feel love. And there were, there were times that I would pop in on, on social media and I'd see somebody saying, man, I hate it when Christians blah, blah, blah. And I'd go, hi. I would just go, <laughs> well, except for you, you're different. Um, I have one person who got into business with me and she said, I don't like Christians at all. She had, um, she had had an apartment over a television studio for a while that was a very prominent televangelist that wasn't somebody who was great. And she mm -hmm. said they would take my parking space and they were the worst neighbors and they were the worst people to work with. And she said, but I got into business with you. And then I found out that you were a Christian and I thought, well, okay, that's the kind that you need to be. I am not in any way, shape or form coming down angry at either side i am the person who comes in in the middle and says why can't we all kind of just talk to each other um the bible talks about blessed are the peacemakers hmm. um there's a big difference between being a peacekeeper and a peacemaker and i think when you are a peacekeeper you are placating either side you are just going along with whatever the Bible calls us to be peacemakers and that's where you wade into a war zone and it gets ugly and you say, how can we talk to each other? That's an ugly place. Um, being a bridge, the entire job of a bridge is to lay down and get roll, <laughs> run over. But that's what we're called to be and do sometimes. And it's not easy. Yeah. And thanks for coming to my TED talk. Wow. <laughs> 
Well, that's a beautiful place to, I think, start wrapping things up. We've been going for almost an hour and a half. And I, I told you beforehand, I was like, mm, I think we'll run maybe 45 minutes to an hour. But I told you, like, there's just so much. I mean, we haven't even touched the, you know, broken the surface of all of the things about you and uh, your career and your life. But um, I think we've touched on so many different things that are just fascinating. So maybe we'll we'll have to do a part two sometime to go a little bit deeper. I'm more than um, happy to come back and do a part two and we can talk yeah. about business and yeah. marketing and hit hit all of those things in the business of writing as well. I'm happy to talk about any of that. Yeah. So uh, we, we talked about the fact that uh, no one could really become like you. You know, if, if anybody was like, Lori, how can I become like you? You're just going to be like, well, can you go through all of the things that I've been through and, you know, get picked up based on, you know, random fan fiction that you wrote? And yeah. like, there, there's just so many different things about your career path that are, are not duplicable. So um, for anybody, though, that is thinking about going into marketing just in general or writing, what's maybe one piece of advice that you would give them? Um there's a lot of there's a lot of layers to both marketing and publicity and even writing <clears throat> don't be myopic mm. don't have tunnel vision um always you know I, when i work in publicity people say things like don't read the comments you're just gonna get angry i have to read the comments to see what people are saying i need to know what people what vision people are having and um that's a very important thing and don't you're not going to succeed in these things if you have if you aren't open to seeing what people are saying hearing even the criticisms and the ugly and um yes there is value in systems i as much as i say shake up the snow globe there are those strategic things that that you do need to do to stick with um, you can't throw everything out, but don't be afraid to be different and say, where can I make it different? Yeah. What, how can I, how can I still hit the markers that I need to hit and still follow the checklist, but make it step aside, make it kind of stand out so that there is a unique journey or something that will make people excited about your project, about whatever it is that you're working on. Okay. So be as creative as possible within you know the the guardrails then is that kind of exactly yeah don't don't dismiss the guardrails and be as creative as possible and you know one of my life taglines is if the lord opens the door i'm gonna dance through it and i mm. don't always do that really well because he opens the door and i go really this door you want me to walk through really <laughs> my friends can attest because they're the ones who will get the phone call saying this was really stupid I shouldn't have said I would do this or whatever but um if God opens that door for you and it is God doing the door not us then don't be afraid to walk through it and see what is on the other side awesome well Lori thank you so much for joining me today this was a, a blast of a conversation for those of you watching Lori Twitchell check her out. Uh, she has got a website, lauritwitchell.com. Please check out Beyond the Buzz marketing and uh, everything that, that she has out there. Um, just She's got great advice and uh, does great work. And so I look forward to having more conversations with you and um, seeing what the Lord does to, to use you in the, the space that we're in at, at some point in the near future. Well, thank you. I'm very excited that we connected. Um, if you are a nerd and you are a Christian, visit Christian Nerd Unite as well, because obviously great connections are there. Um, and yeah, thank you for having me. I look forward to a part two and whatever else comes along. All right. Sounds good. Have a great day. All right. You too.